Good morning, everyone, and most welcome to Heidegger 1433. I will continue where we left off. We are still discussing the problems of the inner, and I am currently at page 16. The second paragraph. And we've been talking about the likeness of doing inner calculation with doing proper calculation as an act. And we mentioned briefly that the language of experience or psychology is a different language game to the language game of reality. They work side by side, but they do follow definitely different rules. Something that is important to bear in memory. And, uh, I said in the summary 1432 that this is actually solving the mind and matter problem, the dualism of René Descartes, and taken up by Strawson, John Searle, Hilary Putnam, Austin, Ludwig Wittgenstein, and so many others. It's a persistent feature of Western philosophy. <coughs> and the example is of calculating in the head. That shows that when I report about calculating, it is different from actually calculating. And this two acts or two doings or two things we almost always confuse in ordinary language and thereby, so to speak, inducing an idea of something being res cogitans, not material, since it doesn't seem to be following the rules of matter and res extensa, the other thing, the matter. The variety of ways in which calculating in the head might be expressed show how the phenomenon can be looked at in many different ways. Indeed, despite our obsession with inner processes, there is no reason why it has to be seen as a process at all. And already I need to repeat because this is absolutely decisive. Despite our obsession with inner processes, there's no reason why it has to be seen as a process at all. As Wittgenstein points out, it could easily be seen under a completely different aspect. A quote from Wittgenstein here. Yeah. 
one teaches someone to calculate in his head by ordering him to calculate. But would it have to be like that? Might it not be that in order to get him to calculate in his head, I do not have to say calculate, but rather do something else, only get the result, or shut your mouth and your eyes and keep still, and you will learn the answer. I want to say that one need not look at calculating in the head under the aspect of calculating although it has an essential tie-up with calculating, nor even under the aspect of doing. For doing is something that one can give an exhibition of. And that's a decisive difference. You can always exhibit calculating. You can show your calculus, your abacus, or your notifications on a piece of paper. But when it comes to inner calculating, there is nothing to see, nothing is visible. There doesn't seem to be any rules in the same way since you cannot observe in your calculating. And uh, let me put a comment, this is exactly where the problem of the inner starts. By not understanding, there are two completely different sets of rules applying here from the language games. Far from treating it as the same as calculating on paper, it would be possible to view calculating in the head as a completely different activity. Only one which has a useful feature of providing a paperless way of finding the answer to a sum. Alternatively, it might be seen not as an activity at all, but simply as a capacity people have or can be trained to have. 
in fact it would even be possible for a group of people to reject the connection with the inner all together In their case, the individual would be taught to say, or might spontaneously say, I calculated unreally. And anyone who talked of something going on inside her would be laughed at or treated as mentally retarded. <laughs> However, even if the inner process is disposed of in this way, this does not mean that all that is left is the outer process, the behavior, for in addition to the behavior, there is also the language game we play with the utterance. <laughs> Wittgenstein's attack on the notion of inner processes does not imply that only the outer matters. <laughs> The behavior, for in addition to the behavior, there is also the language game we play with the utterance. It's very important. On the contrary, by bringing out the true nature of utterances, he underlines the fact that we aren't just interested in behavior. We do not just want to know that the person's body was in such a such a position and her features arranged in such a such a way. Rather, we are interested in her account on what lay behind this behavior. We want to know whether her restless actions and thoughtful look were because she was having difficulty working out to some or because she was worried about losing her job. To sum up, hey, no, we can't sum up. Let me just make a really quick summary here, and that is. The inner and outer has played philosophy and thinking for eons. And what Wittgenstein does here, he actually resolves the problem, but in a way that is incredibly unexpected. It comes from a region 
we had no idea about. But I will continue, and I named this 1133. Sorry, 1433. And I have to. Uh, Thank you. Uh, let me comment on this page by Paul Johnston, um, page 16. Um, I repeat, I quote in Wittgenstein. One teaches someone to calculate in his head, order him to calculate. So would you compare it with, with the words that that the son of Niels Bohr, Olgi Bohr, said to his students, shut up and calculate. That was regarding the at atoms. Well, this text is extremely difficult, and uh, there is a point here, Kalle, definitely. And it is that in shut up and calculate, we sort of go to the action itself only. And that does its own language game, so to speak, to make a parallel to the text. Whereas our explanations of the happening is actually following other rules. So you can see a parallel here between the above side, the abstraction that we often call it. Uh, Wittgenstein wouldn't agree that it was an abstraction. It would say it is of a completely different nature, following completely different rules and thereby of an essence that is separate. The confusing of these things are what is causing the problem. And I would say both with quantum physics, which makes it very hard to understand, but also the relation between inner and outer. And inner and outer, as I said earlier, has plagued philosophy for eons, millennia, literally. The finishing comment, or? No, okay, I could say something. So uh, please turn it around if you need it. I don't know. Uh, so okay, so we could say that uh, when they asking the student, uh, the, the, the son of uh, this boy, if the atoms were real, he would have said, uh, "Shut up and calculate. Uh, shut up and work. Uh, that is, atoms are not real." Even today, we shouldn't see them as real. They are working only working models, uh, and we could say, let's say that we we change out the atoms against um, mathematics like calculating and numbers. Are they real or not? They are not real in one way. And so where is the line between real and real? That's what my point. And I would like to say, it has. Well, I I finish off here. I would say it's a very good example of Olga Bohr that the word real has its own language game. And it doesn't make sense to speak about real or either unreal when it comes to the atom. Neither fits the picture. And if you think of it, it makes sense. Why would real be something you can apply to the whole spectrum of language games? Well, you can't. And it's an excellent point here, Kalle. Thank you very much. You really, really got it directly. Of course, it's going to be more complicated as we dwell further into inner and outer. Say so thank you very much and have a very pleasant morning. Bye-bye. Thank you.